honored uh, to be here back at my alma mater, uh, where it all began for me many years ago to deliver a lecture named for my predecessor uh, then in the House of Representatives when I first was elected to the House, uh, a great New Jerseyan, former Congressman Frank Guarini. In establishing this lecture series, Frank Guarini put thoughtful debate of the issues front and center. And I would say to all of you, there is no better place than to continue that debate and discussion here at St. Peter's College with its Jesuit tradition and devotion to excellence in education. And I really have appreciated what St. Peter's has meant to so many generations uh, who many times it was the first in their families uh, who achieved educational opportunity at this institution. Uh, and I have uh, delighted in seeing its growth and its incredible uh, cadre of uh, alumni, uh, distinguished alumni, several of which are here today, the former Speaker uh, of the New Jersey Assembly, uh, Joe Doria, uh, Judge Callahan, uh, a very successful businessman in our community, Joe Penapintle, and I'll stop there before I get in trouble, uh, not naming everybody, but they, uh, they, I, I appreciate them being here as well. Uh, and certainly, Nicholas Chiavrilotti, who is the executive director of the Guarini Institute, who was my former state director uh, and uh, is doing a fantastic job in uh, re-energizing the institute, and I'm thrilled uh, uh, to be here uh, at his uh, request as well as the colleges. So uh, today I, I want to talk about, uh, in essence, uh, a vision of America that moves towards civility uh, fairness and compromise, uh, and that talks about uh, what type of America uh, we want to be. I want to focus on, on domestic and some uh, international issues, not, ju not just in terms of how they fit into a political ag uh, agenda, but whether our, policy, our policies satisfy the vision of what we want uh, America to be and what we expect America to represent to the world. And of course, first and foremost is the uh, obvious economic situation we face in our country. I think uh, there is a consensus uh, in the Senate and in the Congress that we cannot let debt rise as a growing percentage of GDP and be a prosperous nation. Uh, but how we meet that challenge over the next decade uh, and how we ensure uh, what in essence has been the very uh, critical elements of creating American prosperity uh, don't get uh, undercut in our drive to ensure that that debt uh, is uh, reduced dramatically and tamed. In essence, there is a balance at the end of the day. How do we uh, prepare for that debt reduction over the next decade for which there will be difficult choices? But at the same time, how do we continue to make investments that are critical to America's prosperity and its future? Uh, and so, in my mind, there are three fundamental questions that we must ask to decide how we move forward. What do we stand for as a people and a nation? What do we expect the role of government to be? What is our vision of America? My vision of America came from a woman who had great personal faith, a faith in her God, faith in her family, and an abiding faith in her new country, and faith in me. She came here as a political refugee from Cuba, leaving her country from a dictator from the right, and looking at a pretender uh, hiding in the mountains, and thinking this is not where I want my children uh, to ultimately uh, grow. And so she came to America to live in freedom, where I was born. She came and dreamed of a better life for herself and her family. She gave me hope, she gave me strength, and even though, I know some will not believe this, I was incredibly child, uh, uh, shy when I was uh, younger, uh, she gave me a belief in myself, a belief that if I put my mind to it, I could do just about anything. She believed in the power uh, of a good education and made me believe I could be the first in my family to go to college, to come here to St. Peter's. The journey she set me on took me from a tenement building in Union City through college and law school, from Pope Hall to the halls of Congress in Washington, D.C. And if you told me at that part of my life, uh, growing up poor in a tenement, 
that I could rise to be one of 100 United States senators in a country of 308 million people, I would have told you that's highly unlikely. But it is the promise of America fulfilled. It is a promise I fight to make true for future generations of Americans. She is no longer uh, with me. She, is, uh, she was the victim of a long battle with Alzheimer's. But I know the promise America held for her, and it was a promise fulfilled. The America I see, the America I believe in, reflects that promise. It reflected that promise even in the earliest days of the current economic crisis uh, where the future may look for some uh, pretty dim. I have a different vision. Uh, I want to give us a sense of where we are, be uh, but where we came from to understand what our challenges are today. If you go and visit me in Washington at the Archives Building, on the portal of the Archives Building it says, what is past is prologue. Uh, and I think we need a sense of where we're coming from to help us lay out a vision and a path for what comes next. Uh, probably in my 38 years of public service, uh, the most incredible meeting I ever was asked to go to was in September of 2008, when the chairman of the Federal Reserve, uh, Chairman Bernanke, the Federal Reserve in essence of the central bank of this country, uh, and the Secretary of the Treasury, Secretary Paulson, uh, then uh, the Treasury Secretary under former President Bush, asked members of the Banking Committee, of which I was, uh, am one still, and members of the Senate leadership to come to an emergency meeting. And in that meeting, Chairman Bernanke laid out a series of financial institutions in our country that were on the verge of collapse. And he said if they collapse, they will create systemic risk to the entire country's economy, and every American will feel the consequences of that collapse. And he went on to describe a series of incredible actions he wanted the Congress to take in response to the pending crisis. And in the question and answer session, I remember asking Chairman Bernanke, I said, Mr. Chairman, surely you must have enough tools at the Federal Reserve to get us through this period of time because the scope, the size, and the immediacy with which you are asking us to act is unprecedented. And he looked at me and he said the most chilling thing I've heard in 38 years of uh, public service. He said to me, Senator, if you and your colleagues don't act in the next two to three weeks, we will have, his words, not mine, a global financial meltdown. And the room was pretty aghast. And I said to him, uh, that would mean a new depression. And he said, if we allow it to happen, that's exactly what it will mean. Markets will pancake across the globe. There'll be a run of the banks, and we'll have a depression uh, unlike how this nation uh, lived through a depression under former President Roosevelt. Now, whatever you may think about Chairman Bernanke's economic policies, you have to understand this. He is not a politician. He is an academician. His expertise is in Depression-era economics, how the nation got into the last depression, what worked and did not work in getting it out of that depression, and so it was incredibly telling and consequential in his remarks. That was September of 2008, before we even had a presidential election of 2008. Then the new president was elected uh, later that year and doesn't take office until January of 2009. He is now faced with this not great recession that we often talk about, but on the verge of a new depression. And he is faced with the challenges of an economy in which he inherits 7.5% unemployment before he does anything, two wars raging abroad, totally unpaid for, put on the next generation of Americans to pay, tax cuts that were totally unpaid for, and I support tax cuts that make sense and help stimulate economic uh, activity and create greater access for economic empowerment to middle class families, but you have to pay for them. Otherwise, all you do is drive up debt. We had a decade of about tax cuts totally unpaid for, and we had a new entitlement program totally unpaid for, and finally, we had a marketplace that instead of being a free market, and I believe in a free market, which where anybody uh, makes a decision to make an investment, 
uh, and I'm rooting for them that it goes well and that their investment turns out well. But if it goes poorly and it fails, I don't want it to become the collective risk of all of us to have to pay because of their decisions. And instead of a free market, we had a free-for-all market without the regulations and the regulators uh, paying attention and being the cop of the beat, they were asleep at the switch. And the confluence of all of that is, in fact, what this new president inherits and what the Congress has to deal with. So we had to act to stop those financial institutions from collapsing. We had to act to try to get the economy's uh, heartbeat moving again. Uh, and we had to act so that we would not uh, have the auto industry in the country, which is the, one of the last bastions of manufacturing in our country and all of the supply chains that uh, respond to uh, that need, who not only are, many of which are here in New Jersey, but also who produce for other industries, but without the foundation of the auto industry, would totally disappear. And all of that was the crisis of 2008. So that is the basis, I say that as a starting point to understand our challenges still today. That is what we're coming out uh, of. And so uh, it seems to me that now the question is, uh, what is uh, our response for the future? I've always said, if you show me your budget, I will show you your values. Uh, that's true in our personal lives. We all have a budget. We may not think about it. Uh, but certainly it's income by however we derive it, uh, whether we have some type of employment uh, or later on in life when you're in your respective professions and you may have a little extra money and you make some investments and you get some dividends from those investments, some interest from those investments, uh, you know, whatever it may be, that's how our revenue is and our expenses are those things that we put values on. You know, uh, the uh, education that we want for our children, the home we keep with our family, the church, synagogue, or mosque that we tithe to, uh, the charitable contributions we make to organizations we believe provide a good cause. And those are an expression of our personal values. The nation's budget is a, are an expression of our collective values as a country. So if you show me what your budget is, I will show you your values. The bottom line is, uh, for me, is that we need to decide before we continue on the march that we are on uh, what we believe makes America uniquely America. What sets us apart from other nations? What's the role of government and what that government should and can do? And then based on those determination, determine what our course is from there, uh, what are our values. We need to have that debate, but above all, we need to conduct that debate with civility, a sense of fairness and a willingness to compromise. And it is that challenge in the Congress today and a willingness to compromise that is a fundamental uh, challenge that we need to overcome. Um, you know, I, I look at the recent uh, challenges we had in meeting the nation's debt ceiling. The debt ceiling is only about an obligation to pay that which you already have an obligation to pay. It's the equivalent of using your credit card, uh, getting the bill and deciding that you don't want uh, to pay the bill that you, in, that you created. Uh, a debt limit is basically the Congress acts on a whole series uh, of uh, authorizations and expenditures. It thinks it's appropriate on behalf of the nation in education and research and development, uh, in the National Institutes of Health, uh, in the national defense, in the national security, uh, you know, and a whole host of things. And then the executive branch, the president, ultimately executes on it. And having met those obligations, acquired those obligations, the debt ceiling is not about future debt, but it's about simply uh, pay being responsible for that which you already have incurred. And so that debate, we had a situation in which uh, never in the nation's history, never in the nation's history, has there been a condition precedent to be able uh, to have an up or down vote on whether or not the ceiling should be raised? Ronald Reagan uh, raised it 18 times without condition. George W. Bush raised it seven times without condition. But when it came to this new Congress, for the first time in the nation's history, conditions were created. Now, uh, the fact is that I have no problem, even though I believe it should be a clear up or down vote, but I have no problem in considering conditions except 
when there is no compromise in that march, when in fact it was just driven by an ideological view, particularly uh, from colleagues who uh, align themselves with the Tea Party and the House of uh, Representatives and who are intransigent uh, in the purity of their ideology so that they are committed to this point of view uh, to the exclusion of all other realities, of all other views, uh, of all other uh, points of principle. Uh, and after uh, governing at many different levels as a school board member, as a mayor, as a state legislator, as a member of the House of Representatives and now in the Senate, I know one thing. You cannot govern from a broad, diverse of views and experiences by ideology. You can only govern at the end of the day by an amalgam of those views and principles that work towards compromise and negotiation towards a common goal. That does not mean you have to ultimately uh, abandon your principles, but by the same token, you have to accommodate a divergent set of views in the nation. And that is a challenge that we have today. So as someone who has voted a series of times to do things that are critical, uh, voted to establish the Bipartisan Task Force for Responsible Fiscal Action, the precursor to what has become known across the country as the Bull Simpson Commission to review all aspects of our financial conditions, as someone who has supported a, a balanced, reasonable, fair approach that implements significant but responsible reductions, as someone who has voted to reduce the budget deficit by $154 billion with a balanced approach to cutting our deficits that include discretionary spending, entitlements, and revenues. As someone who has supported budget enforcements like statutory pay goes so that basically if you have a new idea for a program or some benefit or for some tax cuts, fine, but you have to find your way to pay for them so we don't continue to rise debt. As someone who led the effort in the Senate chamber to cut $21 billion in oil subsidies for the big five oil companies that are going to make $144 billion in profits this year and certainly don't need $21 billion of our collective tax monies in order to do what the marketplace has allowed them to do. Uh, as someone who doesn't believe that we have to spend another $6 billion in ethanol subsidies for big agro companies uh, that are only driving up food prices at the end of the day, and I could give you a long list of those, uh, we have, I think, the wherewithal to take very responsible approaches. But that means uh, an effort at compromise and negotiation, not on a dogmatic view. And so I, I look as we approach uh, something that has been called the Super Committee, uh, which is now, as a result of that debt ceiling debate, um, given the task to think about how we further reduce debt uh, in the country. And so in my mind, part of the challenge of that super committee and those of us who will have to cast a vote should they come to a conclusion uh, that can uh, offer us an up or down vote on an alternative is this, as I have said to many members of the commission. We have to think about those things that create American prosperity that create the foundation for America's future, for a growing economy. And we must preserve those investments now in the short term so that we can grow over the long term. At the same time, we have to make decisions about those things that we can no longer afford to do or no longer afford to entitle people. Uh, and that is part of the equation. And we also need, as part of that equation, closing tax loopholes like the two that I suggested, and there are many more, and thinking about what shared sacrifice in the country really means, that it cannot be asked simply of the middle class or the next generation of Americans. And if we do the amalgam of those three things, we can once again not only get our fiscal house in order, but we can create prosperity for the future. Uh, we did this once before. It's when I first came to the Congress in 1993. It was President Clinton as the president. We had an economic challenge in our country, and the Deficit Reduction Act uh, of 93 uh, took this principle that I just espoused. It took cuts in spending, 
uh, that we could no longer afford. It took some entitlement changes, and it brought new revenue. And the jointure of those three uh, realities created the first balanced budget in a generation, record surpluses, low unemployment, low interest rates, low inflation, and the greatest peacetime economy in over a generation, a formula that clearly worked on behalf of the nation's prosperity and future. It is a formula that we can and should revisit again in order to achieve uh, the opportunity that we need for our country. Now, uh, it is not, in my mind, unreasonable to expect that that formula uh, can be achieved. Uh, certainly, our debate has been intense, but we will accomplish nothing if the debate is not civil and does not lead to a fair compromise. If we do not understand that our own opinion is not the only opinion that matters, that our political views, however strongly held, are not the only views, we will not solve uh, our challenges. Our vision of America needs to begin with civility in our politics and in our lives so that we can look across the table uh, or across the aisle at those who have uh, deeply held views that maybe I strongly disagree with, but still find common ground. I see an America that welcomes differing opinions and intense political debate, but also puts a premium on civility, on intellectual curiosity, on the facts, on the science, as each of you do in your classes and studies. In the America I envision, uh, it is praiseworthy to be smart. Uh, too often we hear cable news shows that seem to think that it is cooler to be opinionated. You know the ones that I mean, the ones that are more interested in creating tension than in creating the truth. In my view, the debate has to begin and end with the truth as a foundation. We can disagree on policy, but we can't disagree on the importance of basing the facts on the truth. One fact is that in addressing this economic crisis that we have, that Ben Bernanke uh, that I described to you three years ago. Some of you may have seen, if not, I'd, I'd call to your attention the HBO special, Too Big to Fail. Uh, it gives, that scene that I describe is in it, but it goes beyond that and tells you the challenges that we face as a country. Uh, in my view, uh, part of what we need to do in this debate and how we get back on the road to economic prosperity is a combination of several factors, making the right fiscal choices now, but preserving uh, educational opportunity and excellence, innovation, research and development, and changing our energy paradigm in this country. I spent a lot of time on those elements because I think they're keys to uh, creating prosperity once again in America. You know, when I talk about changing our energy paradigm, I find it incredibly alarming uh, that we send nearly a trillion dollars abroad uh, to countries that are despotic, wish us ill, and at the end of the day we fuel their despotism because by an act of nature they sit on large reserves of oil, and because of our addiction to foreign oil, uh, we have a great transfer of wealth from America to these countries, who then we give them the wherewithal to act out against the national interest and security of the United States. Instead of creating a new generation of great paying jobs here in America, creating American energy, fueling American prosperity, devising American ingenuity that can be promoted throughout the world, and that can clean up our environment at the same time. And that is uh, one of the necessary things that we need to do, as well as be at the curve of innovation, as well as be at the curve, of the apex of education. We are challenged today more than ever before uh, in a global economy in which the boundaries of mankind have largely been erased in the pursuit of human capital. You are challenged by a billion Chinese and Indian uh, students who are graduating uh, with rigorous uh, educational discipline and countries that are making major investments in this regard. You will compete in a global economy in which those boundaries that I suggested that once existed for mankind have largely been erased in the pursuit of human capital for the delivery of a service or the creation of a product. So that an engineer's report is done in India and sent back to the United States for a fraction of the cost, 
A radiologist report is done in Northern Ireland and read at the local hospital here by your doctor. Or if you have a problem with your credit card, as I recently did, I got this bill on my credit card and it was for some bar I've never been at. But looking at the tab, I wish I had been there because they must have had one hell of a party. Uh, but it wasn't mine. Uh, and I called the credit card company to say, hey, this is my charge. And I ended up with a call center in South Africa. In the pursuit of human capital for the delivery of a service or product, we are globally challenged, which means for America to continue to be a global economic leader, we need to be at the apex of the curve of intellect the most highly educated generation of Americans the nation has ever known, if we are going to be the center of innovation uh, and creativity in the world. And so I have a problem as we meet some of these challenges that we have uh, in the country. When I hear some of my colleagues suggest that we can cut our way into prosperity, that we can dramatically underfund education, whether at the elementary and secondary level, or certainly cut back on Pell and Perkins grants uh, to create educational opportunity. For me, that is not an esoteric exercise, because as someone who grew up poor, the only way that I came here to St. Peter's College was because of Pell and Perkins loans, and the only way that I got through Rutgers Law School is because of the same. I understand the power of that educational opportunity, and I am not about to allow America to move backwards in creating the opportunity for future generations of students which create American prosperity, ingenuity, and innovation in the world. That is the type of choice that we have to make uh, in the days ahead. It is the type of choice that led me to uh, uh, pass a, a law that ultimately helped our small biotech firms uh, here in the state of New Jersey with some incredible research that is taking place with very high skilled jobs but that are at the cutting edge uh, of helping create the cures to the Alzheimer's that took my mother's life or the Parkinson's disease that ravages one of your fathers, or the cancers that has killed one of our family members. Uh, that uh, is an example of investment in innovation and research and development that produces long-term benefits in the lives of our people and also in our economy. It is that type of investment that uh, we need to continue to provide. It's that type of investment that in many respects through the tax code as a member of the Senate Finance Committee that I have enhanced. Now I believe in helping middle class families and working families be able to continue that American promise. Uh, that's why uh, last year in the tax debate, I made sure that the middle class tax cuts were preserved and I made sure and led an effort on something we call the alternative minimum tax. Uh, that uh, is a tax, sort of like a hidden tax, it was a tax that was created uh, many years ago for those who used the tax code and paid zero towards the public good, the collective good. Uh, but it was never indexed for inflation, so now it bites middle class families in New Jersey. Uh, and that's 1.5 million of our families who would have to pay a higher tax as a result simply uh, of bad tax structure. Uh, I created the law that gives us two years of relief as we figure how we ultimately uh, achieve eliminating that particular tax so that middle class families have the resources to help their dreams and aspirations uh, become a reality. Um, and then lastly, uh, being strong at home allows us to be a leader in the world. And while there are those who have the views that in fact we should insulate ourselves from the rest of the world, uh, that is so naive to, uh, not to understand the global society in which we live in and the consequences in our lives here at home of what takes place throughout the world. Where in, until we break uh, through on our energy independence, when there is a disruption uh, in the oil supply system, you see gas prices rise. Uh, that affects your life and your ability to get around and puts less pocket in your, less money in your pocket. Uh, when uh, our challenges abroad affect our national security, uh, you see the sons and daughters of America uh, be called upon uh, to go fight uh, in other countries. Uh, when we look at marketplaces and we want to sell American products and services uh, throughout the globe, a global trading system is part of that challenge. And so to believe that we can isolate ourselves within the confines of the continental United States is to have a myopic view of the future. 
but you have to be strong at home to be able to lead in the world. We have to decide what our vision of America is uh, in that respect and to promote the power of our ideas as much as the power of our bombs. Uh, and that is incredibly important uh, in my work in the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. We are living right now, this, all of you, are living in an incredibly changing world. Probably for those of us who are older, the last time such major change took place in, the, in any part of the world was the collapse of what was the Soviet Union and the Eastern Bloc countries that had, excuse me, an enormous shift in the world. Now we see a different shift in a different part of the world. Uh, if you think about it, it was only a few months ago that we were riveted uh, on Tahir Square in Egypt uh, and its movement there. And then you had the earthquake and tsunami in Japan and the consequences that means to our economy here because of the intense economic uh, ties we have with Japan. And then you had uh, Gaddafi bombing innocent civilians in Libya. And then you saw the entire movement across North Africa and the Arab world. A tectonic shift, a shift that presents opportunities but also challenges. And our hope as a country is that we can engage in that part of the world so that that shift ends up being more democratic and secular and less theocratic and autocratic at the end of the day, both in the national interest and security of the United States and some of our major allies. It is also a time in which we must reassess, I believe, uh, where our engagement is abroad. Uh, as someone who voted against the war in Iraq because I sat in the intelligence room and spent a lot of time looking at what was or was not the evidence, it became very clear to me that there was no evidence of weapons of mass destruction, no clear and present danger to the United States, no imminent threat, and I have a standard. Uh, I will vote to send my son and daughter into war if the nation's security is at stake. But I will not vote to send them or anyone else's sons and daughters if the cause is not right. And so uh, in Iraq, our cause, in my view, was wrong. In Afghanistan, our original cause was right, and I supported President Bush in that regard because that's where Osama bin Laden was at the time. That's where al-Qaeda were. Those were the perpetrators of September 11th. They cost the lives of over 700 citizens in New Jersey and nearly 3,000 fellow Americans. But now it is time to reassess where we are in Afghanistan. I do not believe in the Karzai government, and I do not believe that, in fact, we can continue a counterinsurgency effort that fights the Taliban uh, to try to prop up the Karzai government in Afghanistan, but instead need to change our dynamics into a counterterrorism effort where we strike at al-Qaeda along the Afghan-Pakistan border. Uh, and reduce dramatically the number of troops, uh, bring them home, uh, and at the same time uh, meet our essential security challenges against those who wish us harm, which is really al-Qaeda in that region. It takes a reassessment of our worldview, both for our engagement abroad and our ability and resources to prioritize what is in the national interest and security of the United States. So let me sum up uh, so we can have some of your questions in this way. We have to decide what our vision of America is, what it is to look like and what we want to stand for before we make the difficult choices before us. We have to decide who we are uh, and what our values are. I see a responsible America that makes difficult choices to reduce the deficit, but that also recognizes its obligation to preserve the concept of community and keep the dream alive for every American. I see a tolerant America that does not point fingers at immigrants or any segment of the population and say they are to blame, they are the problem, and then treats them as second-class citizens. I see a healthy America with guaranteed access to quality, affordable health coverage that isn't denied because of a pre-existing condition or the whim of an insurance executive who is driven more by the bottom line than the health of a patient. I see a job-creating entrepreneurial America in which businesses in New Jersey benefit from some of the initiatives we already have passed and some that we are still considering. An America that meets the challenges this president has faced when he came into office by helping families keep their homes, finding jobs, and recover from an economic crisis that took us to the brink of a new depression. 
I see a united America that embraces the belief that we are one community, indivisible, each of us working together for the betterment of all of us, united by our common concerns, not divided by our differences. I see a gender-blind, fair America that knows that women are the backbone and broad shoulders of the community and deserve their equal pay for equal work. That is the America I see and believe we can accomplish. Let me conclude by saying I understand that my vision of America is not the only vision. Each of you has your ideas of what America should be. But all of us should have a united vision of America, where the American dream is preserved for future generations at home and where we continue to be a beacon of light to the rest of the world. Our leadership in the world is not accidental. It did not come because we as a nation chose to disinvest in America's future, in its infrastructure, in its environment, in its people, in making our air clean, our water safe, our food and drug supplies the safest in the world, our health care system and technology the most advanced. These are choices that we made because we had a vision of what we wanted America to be and what we wanted our democracy to represent around the world. We are at that moment again to ask those fundamental questions. As we face difficult budget choices and new world events, we need first to decide what our vision of America is and what we want the outcome to be. Uh, to me, that is a rising sun, not a setting sun. This is a country that sent its sons and daughters uh, to fight fascism and Nazism in two world wars and succeeded. It is a country that put a man on the moon and created a technological and scientific revolution uh, and led the world uh, in that regard since then. It is a country that took diseases that were thought to be uncurable and found the cures for them. And it is a country that can continue to be great uh, if we decide together that our future is collective, that there are sacrifices to be made, but there are investments that must be preserved in order to create American prosperity. That is the choice and question for each and every one of us. Thank you very much for having me with you, and then I'm happy to answer questions.